Hi everybody, my name is Clive Bolton and uh, the past uh, couple of years I've been working on blockchain technologies so um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot going on in the last couple of years and uh, so this talk is uh, really what I've uh, learned about the past, the present and the future and uh, about blockchain. So um, we've been through like a, almost like a a dot-com boom uh, over this period and so I wondered when I first got into this why my LinkedIn would just go nuts entrepreneurs were clicking trying to get my attention to build stuff for them and uh, and but um, but this talks really not going to concentrate on the crypto kitty stuff it's going to focus more on crypto commerce uh, crypto commerce is a um, Perhaps it's not a very good term, but it's a, a term that uh, Mark Miller, uh, somebody who's very involved with computer security, uh, coined. And um, I'm going to talk about that and hopefully uh, actually explore with you um, an, an, an application that might, um, uh, might be able to pass its secrets around, even on something like a mobile app from from module to module safely. So the three things yeah. I'm going to look at is where it came from, which may be a little different than has been shared before, um, where it's at now, blockchain is at now, where it's headed, and um, yeah, and, uh, and, and this really, which is uh, the shift in computing to uh, confidentiality and privacy in computer security, which is really stopping exfiltration of your secrets. So, <clears throat> it's in in my research. This is where uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, and a lot of these technologies actually came from, because it's a composite of different technologies. But actually. Go visit this site. I'm going to post these slides a little bit later and share these. Um, the Agoric papers that were written by Eric Drexler, who's at Oxford, and Mark Miller, who was until recently at, at Google, wrote these papers. Uh, I think more than more than well more than 20 years ago, and um, they they came up with the concept of uh, uh, markets and computation and what they call agoric, which is a Greek word for marketplace systems. And <coughs> they recognized that they, in order to uh, improve computer security, there needed to be some incentives to make systems more secure, and especially provide incentives for developers to develop more secure systems. And <coughs> they, um, they came up with a, a comparative ecology of computational perspective, and both of them, I believe, uh, were influenced, or, or Mark was certainly a, a student of Norm Hardy, who passed away last year, he still has a, a website that's called Catwall, which is, um, and he, he did some pretty pioneer work on uh, computer security, uh, particularly for enterprise software. He was at Liv Lawrence Livermore Labs in a couple of very early e-commerce companies. And it turns out that uh, it was very influential in Mark in terms of language design. And we'll come to that in a moment. And the most interesting thing is that uh, Nick Zebo, uh, who was a student at the University of Washington, uh, somehow picked up on this, on this work and came up with the uh, virtual currency called uh, Bit gold in 1998, 10 years before the ancient invention of, of Bitcoin. And my thing's turned dead, sorry. And, <clears throat> and it's credited really with uh, the going to search this on the internet with the, the invention of smart contracts. It's kind of interesting what a smart contract really is. And it's sort of a stored procedure that can do more things than just a SQL typical stored procedure. It can pass information, commerce information between a couple of parties. 
So, um, Mark Miller, and I have some demos to, to do. Hopefully, I'm going to not screw these up. Um, uh, created something, uh, the e, e programming language, um, which his, uh, that gives you an idea, his, uh, his email address is eRides. E um, and that was his email address at Google, it was eRides at Google.com. And so he created this language, and he also created a, a language uh, called Caja, which means if it's Spanish means put it into a box. So um, the idea was, and this Caja powers a lot of, uh, even today, Google's uh, technologies. And uh, he did a late, um, he did his PhD, he, did his, he had quite a big gap between his, his bachelor's degree and his, and his PhD thesis, his PhD is uh, like 280 odd pages. Uh, I uh, reprised his PhD at Papers We Love. Um, and um, worked, yeah, worked on uh, Google. But also the most important thing here was for about 10 years he was a member of uh, ACMAScript and has been the architect of a lot of five major changes that have gone on to JavaScript that uh, moves JavaScript from a insecure language to a, a secure language, what they call a, a capabilities-based language. So you'd think that JavaScript, because of all the connotations with sort of crypto kitties and scripting, would be um, sort of the, the, and it's known to be, you know, it's known to be sort of insecure, but from a language perspective, it's now um, fairly secure. And there's actually this demo here, this uh, CES demo, um, allows uh, you to explore and run a, uh, run a demo that uh, provides a shim that you can actually insert into your JavaScript in order to uh, properly confine your JavaScript so that it can prevent hackers from uh, exfiltrating keys and other in information. Now that plays into, um, plays back here into this type of application that we're moving to on mobile apps where <coughs> this composite of services, um, credit information from Visa or CRM account, uh, GS1 product detail and your maps from your Google all this information may be coming from different servers, uh, but if you compose those and put those onto an app, um, <clears throat> all these look like trusted companies, but maybe one of these companies is sold and it's, is not trusted, and now you could be, um, this company could be exfiltrated information if each one of these is not in a secure little box. So let's, I'm gonna try and tie that to uh, blockchain technologies. Okay, so uh, a little bit of uh, the recent past. We have been through the, the ICO boom, and now we're in the, uh, sorry, maybe we're coming out of the crypto winter, but a lot of these companies that uh, did their ICOs are now have a, uh, have a listing in the dead coins, including the project that I worked on. Um, and we've also got some other things going on in the recent past. We've got the uh, arrival of the European uh, General Data Protection Rule, and we've got the pretty much the well-known case of Cambridge Analytica, Facebook's data breaches, which uh, perhaps, uh, you know, depending on where you're coming from on the spectrum of the of your viewpoint, is really just uh, some pretty sloppy engineering. If uh, things had been tightened down, perhaps that information wouldn't have been as easy to exfiltrate. Um, and then we've got the, uh, the arrival of, of uh, new technology that spelled that one, they spelled that one, Ethereum, EOS, Ripple, and, and a few more. So, uh, 
it's kind of interesting to to just pop into one of these and take a look how many um, dead coins there are and so and kind of another another uh, interesting aspect of this that some of them are dead because they were actually hacked in other words their wallets that where they collected funds after they did an ICO were just carted off by somebody else who was smart enough to hack into their what Linux system whatever it was and just t take take away their money and um, there's all um, well there's many here and most of these are now deceased or uh, were found out to be scammy so we want to try and uh, or at least I do sort of separate myself from that and I think many other people do the working in the blockchain space and get to to where things are going to and I think there's a couple of different sides to that um, oops let me see Okay, so um, something that's happened, and this is, I just, uh, some of this information has been changing fairly recently, so I thought I'd just drop this in here, but I uh, recently working in talking to, to my boss who told me that um, after the, Chris, the crypto winter, it's been really hard on exchanges. Um, and so they had basically a $60 million backlog in orders for a rewrite for their exchange, which basically has evaporated over the past six or nine months, just gone. All those orders for uh, software and this was uh, at this particular exchange. Um, and um, <coughs> so, um, okay. So um, I wanted to discuss Hyperbridge, which is a project that I was working on with some uh, guys in, in Vancouver, BC. So um, in Vancouver, there's a lot of uh, game artists. And game artists, they create, they create game art uh, for computer games. But then they either have troubles getting paid or um, the, uh, the art that they create is very popular and gets used so many times, but then they don't get credited for their work. So they've, they've created tremendous uh, digital assets, but then those digital assets don't uh, reward them. So uh, fellows I was working with here uh, sort of took the, took, did that knowledge, that research, and they tried to create the, uh, the protocols using the web and actually Ethereum technologies. And <laughs> So the idea was that if you earned um, some uh, game art or you earned some uh, game pieces, it's like a sword or something from one game, you should be able to, once you've earned that reward, you should be able to perhaps take it to a different game and should also be able to compensate the artist for creating the art. So they're working on those types of uh, protocols. And... Um, So there was a pretty well, um, well, a good a good front end that explained the uh, the the journey of the company, groundwork for the platform, market analysis and software development, and and then the funding, and and so forth, but. Things didn't actually pan out too well, and um, it wasn't it wasn't a scam. But the uh, CEO is now in Japan, so um, just just was probably too late to the uh, to the to arrive at and miss that huge burst of funding. So it didn't really uh, attach the attract the um, the investment to propel the solution. However. As I'm going to come to in a moment, uh, 
especially Mark Miller, has been optimizing these uh, secure ECMAScript technologies. So I think this is still a good, um, this type of concept is still good. And in fact, the, um, the SAS technologies have actually been applied by Salesforce to secure their mobile apps across their whole ecosystem. And so the app I showed earlier that was the little, uh, let's put JavaScript into a box, that's actually now a, um, in production. So let's come back here. So I had a, um, the idea of just showing a, a demo as we went along here because it's not really Linux fast unless you try and have a go at the least. Um, so I think I have another copy of this in case something like this happens. So one thing I wanted to explain here was that the, one of the reasons for the um, for many of the failures of the blockchain projects was that it turns out that many of the, the um, technologies were simply not uh, modular enough and not, um, in fact, they needed to be extremely modular. So um, this is going to start up a, well, let's see if it does. This is going to start up a, um, series of dockers. This is starting up Hyperledger's uh, sorted product. And then it's uh, starting starting the, uh, the product up and it's through a series of dockers. And, and then it's inserting into, um, into that, into sorted, something called Hyperledger Grid and the track and trace option. So that all, uh, that all got started there, and it's now, well, the other thing I wanted to kind of show was for folks who haven't worked on blockchain technologies, this is the state of the art. This is kind of like really cutting edge. Um, I only got this working uh, last week after doing a lot of chasing around. Um, there's still in an enterprise blockchain, it's still much, it's, it's really a command line tool. There's very little UI, and, so I wanted to kind of use that context to cover something in a moment. Okay. So, uh, Gavin Wood, um, the former CTO of Ethereum, he was the, the fellow who uh, proposed Solidity the uh, smart contracting programming language for writing smart contracts in the Ethereum uh, ecosystem. And he's now uh, CTO of Parity Technologies and released the, uh, the Parity Bitcoin technology stack. Um, and he has a product uh, or a, uh, technology called Substrate. And what's, what's interesting, what I'm going to explain a little bit down the road is that Microsoft is uh, building its um, uh, blockchain technologies much more in borrowing on, on parity and actually also the uh, hyperledger is also now borrowing from parity. And doc, uh, Dr. Wood, he has a very cool uh, video. I, should, I need to drop the link in here where it basically takes just a fresh MacBook at a, a forum, where it's uh, in the, it's sort of like a theater in the round of, um, where everybody's sitting around and he take, walks a, a developer who's experienced with the command line but has never set up uh, any, anything before to do with blockchain and walks them all through uh, to setting that up using Parity's technology and, and Substrate. And both Miller's work and Hyperledger's work, for pretty much all the work is all now driving towards um, extreme modularity 
in software. Okay. Okay. A, uh, somebody else that I uh, talked to about uh, coming up, especially to uh, come up to Wit, uh, Linux Bash this year, it was Ward Cunningham. I've been working with uh, Ward or collaborating with Ward for the past couple of years. And so Ward's known for, uh, for the first wiki. And uh, it's kind of interesting when he gives a talk about that. Uh, I just throw this in here. He, he kind of came up with a novel concept that when you reach the end of the web, it would be nice if you could just keep going programmatically by adding another page. And that's where the uh, that's where the concept of wiki came from. And of course, he became famous. Well, Wikipedia became probably more famous. Um, but he's now got uh, a new uh, technology called uh, Federated Wiki, and he actually made something to begin with called the world's smallest Federated Wiki. But now it's simply uh, Federated Wiki. And I have my uh, my research on this link. And it's all to do with Mark Miller stuff and some of Ward stuff. But Ward has actually been implementing Miller stuff into FedWiki. And so that Kaha and some and other technologies. And so the FedWiki is really a plugin architecture for Wiki. And instead of um, instead of trying to arrive at consensus on a document on a Wikipedia page about somebody who's controversial like the President of the United States, where everybody's obviously going to be, or different people will have strong arguments and be fighting over the text. Woods kind of says, that's not getting us anywhere. So instead, we'll actually have our own wiki, we'll have our own page, and we'll actually uh, move to more of a GitHub-like concept where we'll, where we'll fork pages. So I can take a page that's been written about somebody controversial, I can change it by making my own, but then, as I can belong to a federation, and within the federation, other people can fork my page, and maybe it'll help us arrive at um, a consensus of ideas without actually having to drive it a common, a common document. But it's a different way of doing things. But the, the important thing is that it's federated technologies. Um, so, um, a little bit about the enterprise, where the enterprise is at on blockchain. Um, so um, Hyperledger is actually an organization a lot like the Apache uh, Software Foundation. And it's actually underneath the, the Linux Foundation umbrella. And so um, in the same way that uh, Apache was the uh, the technologies that was really the Hadoop big data system, uh, Hyperledger is the is the business blockchain technologies, and the, the company which has done probably more at this stage to uh, try to productize that of it was a cloud is, is IBM, and they've got something called their blockchain as a service. But pretty much the the other folks in the cloud are going in this direction, but they're going in slightly. A slightly different focus. Uh, Microsoft has blockchain technologies, but they're, it looks to me as if what they're actually doing is they're working more to um, create a, a blockchain fabric that will allow you to backfit blockchain to your existing uh, Microsoft technologies, such as SharePoint and other things. So you'll be able to ex exchange information. And they have more of a focus on the UI. So <clears throat> that's one that's the reason I believe for uh, building on, on par using parity technologies. Oh, there's, there's another technical reason which is more specific. I'll come to that in a little bit. Um, but notice that parity's uh, you know, claim there is that their solutions are for a trust-free world. And also my, uh, Amazon as well has a quantum ledger database, which is a uh, next generation database um, as part of uh, Amazon's blockchain strategy. So what they're 
coming towards there is, a, is an OLTP database with scalable throughput. I imagine how this works. I was chatting with Amazon uh, folks yesterday, is that um, these OLTP databases, um, I'm not sure if you've got any, I do, I do know we have at least one folk here from the, the enterprise world. This is what uh, SAP's te database technology is now based on OLTP. Um, but I think if you have many of those OLTP applications and they're geographically dispersed for low latency and so forth, then perhaps blockchain is going to play a role there to help you arrive at consensus and consistency. In other words, deal with those uh, acid anatomically issues acid issues um, without actually having to um, go ahead and, and manage that as a developer. And another interesting insight there is that the pretty much all of the research universities that uh, have uh, computer science students have all got uh, grants and, and uh, graduate students working on consensus uh, algorithms. So. I wouldn't recommend working on a new consensus algorithm because the well-paid um, or well-funded uh, uh, projects are going on to do that. In the <coughs> the project that I'm, I'm working on, actually Hyperledger Sorted, which was contributed by Intel and Cargill, um, is um, allows allows you to have a swappable consensus algorithm. So as as new um, consensus is algorithms come along and are useful to use, um, you can swap out like, one particular consensus algorithm for another. Um, so, this just kind of, show, I just wanted to, I clipped this text out because I also wanted to explain that um, DevOps maturity is really changing in blockchain. So early on, uh, this is like, when, when you say early on, I'm talking about like just over a couple of years. Uh, <coughs> IBM was first with its fabric product, but it looks to me as if the uh, Sawtooth product, it's got a lot more open source uh, contributors to it from, from different companies, not all from IBM, is using much more, um, is using, is, is, seems to be using more of the, the, the familiar DevOps tooling. Um, and it also has this, uh, it, it also makes it a lot easier to make sure that the uh, code from your different nodes is actually at the same release version, which is kind of pretty important. Um, so anyways, the, the um, yeah, so sort of offers the ability to, to to arrive at a global state agreement. Uh, okay. Um, so. so this is just a quick scan here of the of the, the hyperledger projects. So these were major projects that contributed, but the main thing to take away from this is that what's going on now is that the projects are actually changing from projects to more to software libraries. So Ursula is a, uh, is a common cryptographic library, and that was released December uh, 2018. There's actually not a lot there. There is, there's a, they're working towards ZK proofs. Um, and so, but these will be shared across the, across the projects. Uh, Grid, which is in, 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 in incubation, this is why I started on the command line, is um, I expect Grid. In, in fact, Transact is, is built on, on Grid. And this proposed for an execution platform, this is actually sponsored by both IBM and by Intel and by Cargill and a, and a couple of other companies. Target actually recently joined. So, so what we're moving away from is sort of uh, projects that were with their own dev teams and their own ways of doing things, much more to a shared uh, shared libraries and reuse of code across um, blockchain. 
and I think that includes parity tech as well because parity seems to be used by many of the um, blockchain projects that have a UI. Okay. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea there, and this is pretty fresh off the page. Uh, so this is, the, this is the way that most of the uh, Hyper Ledger proposal is done, is through a Google Doc, and so you can collaborate on the doc. And, but you notice the sponsors, Bitwise, Cargill. Cargill's, the, I think, the largest US private company. They do meat processing and provide meat to Walmart and all sorts of other companies. Um, Dan from, from Intel, uh, Gary from, from IBM, more to be added. And then there's an, an abstract. But yeah, just wanted to show there that, that this is um, reinforcing that we're moving towards uh, modular cooperation of a blockchain software. Okay. Um, I think this is a bit of a repeat. It's worthwhile looking at the uh, polka dot white paper. The stuff from uh, Gavin Woods, I think perhaps because of his Ethereum background or whatever, it seems to be well uh, marketed or presented. And you're addressing the technology stacks. Um, but this, is, this is kind of the key here, is that uh, blockchains are demonstrating great promise of utility over several fields, including Internet of Things, IoT, finance, governance, identity management, web decentralization, tracking. Um, and we've seen a number of projects reach those significant milestones. Um, um, however, despite the technological promise, we've yet to see real-world deployment of the present technology. That's the kind of... Uh, so it, it's, almost, it's almost what's going on because of the crypto winter it, a sensible reset is going on, perhaps similar to what happened after the dot com, after the, the pets are us and, and all those crazy uh, ideas. What's coming out of it is much more of a focus on the on the software engineering to more towards modularity and reuse in ex, in extreme, obviously extreme modularity. Okay. Kind of mentioned this a little bit, um, but the, the, um, these projects uh, likely to be refactored to use you know, more standard DevOps tools. Um, and an, another thing that's going on is the a recognition from blockchain projects that in a federated world, if you're going to have federated databases and there's going to be um, some business advantages from that, then the different uh, blockchains need to be able to interoperate. And so we're kind of moving away from a world in business of having SQL databases with EDI and those types of technologies that link them together, even though we've moved to like RESTful APIs and and we moved away from um, to, towards JSON documents. At the uh, those JSON documents need to be able to to interoperate. So this is another project which is fostered by Hyperledger, which is Quilt, which is kind of currently undergoing a reboot. A number of projects have uh, cropped up to do interop, but now that it seems that. The, the push is to get them to uh, refactor their software so that they're, the, the, the different projects interoperate in the same way I was guiding earlier to using modular technologies. So there's a, pr a proposal um, to do that as well. Um, 
the enterprise uh, has not really been affected by the, the crypto winter as much. There's still um, digital assets. Uh, well, actually, let me, let me backtrack there a little bit. Digital assets, which was a very well funded, you know, millions and millions of dollars, um, produced a pretty uh, cool uh, smart contracting platform, but now has open sourced that and is now working with um, to to, uh, to to deliver that as part of the sorted product. Um, and, uh, and Walmart is uh, uh, is pr pretty much has a focus on on um, on developing its own um, beef supply chain, so it can cut out this middleman tie zone. So it by by using federation, and you can sort of sort of call it peer to peer, but they're um, creating um, consortiums <coughs> to and and the the GS1 Foundation, which is, uh, I think that's uh, European, but it's got a lot of partners from larger enterprises, has worked on some ISO standards to provide um, very specific identifiers to do just about everything with products, take products off of this. It's, I think that's going to be very supportive of the um, Internet of Things, but for the enterprise. You know, so you've got meat that's on a pallet, you know, the meat is being moved off the pallet, it was at a certain temperature. So all those things are very important for our food safety. So they've, um, <coughs> they've done the standards work and now what's going on is those standards are actually being implemented into the blockchain uh, pr products because the standard is not a, a, a It's not, it's not an out-of-the-box project. It's product. It's only going to become an out-of-the-box product. It looks like when it's implemented in a in a, uh, in a blockchain um, database and smart contracting system. Um, on that note, uh, JP Morgan also they were one of the uh, people. I think especially the <coughs> CEO. You've probably seen that Jamie Dimon, who. He said he'd fire any, any, any of his uh, investment people who invested in, in Bitcoin or any of the cryptocurrencies. But quietly what he's been doing uh, is developing on blockchain technologies, developing something called the, in, the Interbank Bank Information Network built on Quorum, which is, and now they've also developed some, some sort of federation uh, so that different banks will use this for the swaps and settlements. So that's another big uh, direction of blockchain that it seems to be, uh, especially by these very large, by, by these very large companies. Um, the opposite of that is uh, <coughs> and coming back towards Mark Miller's work is the truffle framework the truffle framework is really a, uh, it, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll go and take a look at this link, is really the, um, builds on, on these technologies, Rust, Parity Tech, Substrate, Wasm and Truffle. So Wasm is WebAssembly, and what WebAssembly is gonna give is, it's gonna give us a, the ability to do um, cross, uh, to compile to JavaScript from other languages. So if you're a Java developer or a Dart developer or a Golang developer, and you've uh, you need to get a uh, a small contract to run in the web um, browser, this is this is the, and it's standard based and it's supported by all the main. Uh, I can't say it is supported by all the main browsers, but of course all the main browsers always get like a, a, a different stage of, of adoption. So, but but basically Chrome. And uh, Firefox, Mozilla Foundation, they seem to be the, the two leaders as, as usual. And, um, okay. Now, what's interesting, take a little look at the, I think this is better. 
uh, sweet tools for smart contracts. I think that's that. The interesting thing is that last year in Portland, the Truffle had its conference, and it was in Portland, and there was a lot of folks there from Microsoft. Well, what's interesting is that this year, the Truffle conference is actually going to be at Microsoft in August. So, <clears throat> what I see going on with the other blockchain projects, particularly, they seem to be much more geared towards D2D, to D, you know, banks and supply chain, whereas Microsoft seems to have always uh, had a, like a good, well, a well adopted UI. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> carefully choosing my words there. <laughs> The, uh, and so this seems to be what's going on with the Truffle framework, you know, so you're going to write some code here in, uh, in JavaScript or one of those other languages, you know, if you're using WebAssembly, you can write in whatever language you're familiar with there. And, and then you can cross compile and have your, uh, your uh, small contract run on the web browser. So, uh, I think I'd be tongue-tailed if I said too much more than that, but I'm expecting uh, Microsoft's also building on, 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 the, on the parity and substrate, so I'm, I'm expecting these, myself, I'm expecting these pretty much to come together. I effectively think that that's what's going on, but we'll have to wait until August to kind of get the more insight into that and get hands-on. Um, coming back to uh, Mark Miller's work, and this is like a little. Uh, last year I spoke on on CES work in, in JavaScript at Linux Fest, but that is now matured, and so Mark originally came up with this concept of a VAT, different levels of. of uh, Technologies for JavaScript and different shims, but now um, it's kind of interesting. We've got here, we've got the, we've just got ECMAScript, which is the standards body for JavaScript, and then uh, what came along with ES uh, ES6, it loads a shim in five with strict mode. So I'm assuming like everybody who does JavaScript programming probably uses strict mode, or it's converted their code to strict. And then what happened was Miller invented CES. Uh, and CES provides a, uh, it says here, a confined code. Uh, by freezing everything accessible from the global scope, it removes programs and their abilities to interfere with each other and thus enables isolated uh, evaluation of arbitrary code. So, and then to make that real world, uh, it's got Tiny CES and Jesse, and then we get down to Jason, and we're dealing with. Uh, mutable and immutable properties and observable properties at this level, which is kind of really um, more detail than I, than I can think at, but I can reuse uh, Miller's work. Um, so I should mention that his, his background is in, in addition to developing the E language, was much more in e-commerce companies, pioneering e-commerce companies. So he learned lots and lots of ways, or they learned by looking at their, their logs and, and everything else, all sorts of hacks. And, and that's the E language was actually a built on Java, and it was to turn Java into a secure language. Um, the, and, and this is what's been going on with, with JavaScript itself. And this is, uh, there's something called Frozen Realms. I'm expecting this to turn up in ES7. Um, in what's interesting, uh, I don't think I have this in the deck here, but um, is it Ryan, Ryan Dahl who invented the Node.js? Um, he, uh, he's now working on something that is a, uh, a, a secure version of Node. So that will be, and I believe it pulled, uh, draws on this work. Um, 
so this brings us to to the to the back to the app um, and uh, and back to hyperbridge and what, what we were trying to accomplish there was to to really accomplish this so that each one of these would be perhaps would be a, a computer game and you'd be able to safely move your digital art from one from one game to the other didn't quite get there but um, But there is a, um, a download, and there is code available, and so um, there was the intention to get there. And I think that maybe somebody else, or uh, either Hyperbridge will keep going, or somebody else will either pick this up. And, uh, and I'm expecting to see myself. I'm expecting to see uh, some interesting innovations in this area in terms of. Uh, Digital, digital, digital assets. Uh, in the same way, we can have our own digital identity. I think we should be able to keep our, our, our digital assets and also reward people for producing things like game art. Um, let's see. Um, okay. So. Um, Another, just something else to mention here is that um, Zcash, I actually click on that link, I forgot what I exactly wanted to say here. Yeah, so <coughs> Zcash, uh, which is the raise a lot of money during the, the ICO boom and, and a good a good people um, are actually one of the sponsors of, of, of Mark Miller's work since he left um, Google and they uh, they know producing zero knowledge proofs and this is kind of I think this is going to be important there's even a conference in Berkeley I think it's in May and I think it's as I know, it's free of charge. You just have to be a maintainer, committer to some sort of cryptographic libraries. Um, we're starting to see the adoption of these uh, cryptographic proofs in uh, blockchain projects for the enterprise. And this is another area um, that the top research universities typically have uh, some postgrads doing research. There's all sorts of optimizations you can do for these zero knowledge proofs. It's basically uh, the way I understand it and, and can explain it simplest. Um, instead of just having a, a, a key uh, that's a public private key, uh, there's some way of, uh, of, a, of, uh, of, a, of using a, a um, of using it, putting a curve against that key and exchanging parts of the key so that the whole key, the exchange of the key is anonymous and the, uh, and, and the, and the compute is done uh, over an elliptical curve. And there's, there's also some inefficiencies in that, so there's a great deal of uh, work that's going on in this area. Um, one of the quick things, since we've got folks here from Vancouver, is that the, the, uh, the government in British Columbia has also a uh, adopter of hyperledger projects, particularly the sovereign identity. So apparently in BC, 60% of new companies are formed by just two folks. And so those folks are much more like, uh, their identity is more important than their sort of corporate identity. And so there's a lot of red tape that goes on uh, towards uh, processing the new business. And uh, digital, uh, the Web3 Web Foundation has uh, fostered a uh, digital ID standard, which is being, is being, is being implemented in, in, in by the government of BC through a technology partner. 
to uh, to streamline all the applications that are required to to get a corporation going in, in this you know, in the province of uh, British Columbia. Um. So I think that's all I have on, on my update of uh, past, present, and future. Um, happy to take some questions, try and answer anything, and also or re revisit whatever. Thank you. Yeah. By the way.